Hello, everyone. This is my talk for WTSC 21 on Merkle trees optimized for stateless clients in Bitcoin. This is work I did with my collaborator, Surya Sankagiri. Today, I will talk about stateless nodes. If you're familiar with Bitcoin, you have probably heard of full nodes and light nodes. Stateless nodes have some of the best properties of both. There is a lot of exciting research being done on statelessness. Our work focuses on Bitcoin, but the Ethereum community should be interested as well. In this talk, I'm going to outline some of the background for how stateless nodes work, and then describe our work, which takes advantage of patterns in how people spend Bitcoin to improve the performance of stateless nodes. So the concept of statelessness has to do with lowering the amount of storage required to hold the state of a blockchain. So in the case of Bitcoin, the state of the Bitcoin ledger is just the set of all unspent transaction outputs. The size of the entire Bitcoin blockchain is now around 330 gigabytes, and the size of the set of unspent transactions is about 5 gigabytes. As Bitcoin continues to grow, these numbers will get bigger and the storage requirements of running a node will increase. So full nodes are nodes that download, store, verify, and forward every block and transaction made on the blockchain. And as such, they have to store the full state. To be more efficient, they can forget about transactions that have been deleted that's called being a pruned node, but at a minimum, they must store the transactions for all coins that might be spent in the future. And this amounts to multiple gigabytes of disk space. Satoshi's original solution for this problem was light nodes. So these nodes only download block headers and Merkle branches for transactions that they're interested in. But the downside of running a light node is that you can't check if a block you receive is actually valid. Thus, you can't forward blocks to other nodes to support the network. And also, if you're isolated from the network, a malicious node might be able to convince you that it was giving you a coin that never really existed. Stateless nodes solve both of these problems. So stateless nodes avoid holding the entire state but instead they hold a cryptographic accumulator which represents the state. This allows stateless nodes to receive proofs represented by the purple arrows in this figure that transactions exist in the state. And this way they can verify and forward blocks without worrying that the blocks may be invalid. So one way of having stateless nodes is to include the proofs in the blocks themselves. But Bitcoin doesn't do this. Instead, what has been proposed is a system of bridge nodes, which connect stateless nodes to the main network. So bridge nodes attach proof data to blocks and then send those blocks to stateless nodes. Stateless nodes can then pass these blocks with the proofs attached amongst themselves. The good thing about bridge nodes is that only a single bridge node has to exist for the stateless network to function. Additionally, even if there are malicious bridge nodes, they don't affect the network because stateless nodes can just ignore invalid proofs. So in order to have stateless nodes, we need a cryptographic accumulator. And there are many different constructions of cryptographic accumulators, including ones based on the RSA assumption. Unfortunately, of course, RSA was broken earlier this week, so it's good that our work focuses on hash tree accumulators. Uh, but joking aside, there are good reasons to focus on hash-based accumulators, uh, such as, for example, uh, post-quantum security. So to be more specific, we look at constructions that organize the transactions in ways that make the proofs more efficient with a particular eye to the way that transactions are spent. Uh, and we'll go over a few constructions and then talk about our own approach. 
So first, as a warm up, we'll discuss why regular Merkle trees don't work as an accumulator for this. Uh, vanilla Merkle trees work by hashing pairs of leaves to get nodes at the next level. But when they have an odd number of leaves, Merkle trees resolve that problem by pairing a leaf with itself. And the problem is that when the leaf and the branch in red, for example, is deleted, we are left with a few separate roots, shown here in orange, for Merkle tree parts, which we would then have to keep track of individually. So if we save the roots of these parts after every deletion, we would be storing too much data. What we need is some way of recombining these roots into a more limited set. So U-TreeXO solved this problem by just keeping track of the roots of a collection of perfect binary Merkle trees. So here you can see there's a tree of size 8, a tree of size 2, and a tree of size 1. When we delete the branch in red, we're left with a collection of smaller trees. We can then reorganize these trees from largest to smallest. And then we can get back to a state where we have binary trees by pairing adjacent trees and filling in the hashes. So here we combine the two size two trees into a size four tree. We combine that with the other size four tree to get a size eight tree. And we combine the two size one trees into a size two tree. Adding leaves uses the same process. For example, if we add two new leaves on the right hand side, then we combine them with, uh, we can combine them into a tree of size two and then combine that with the pre-existing tree of size two to get a tree of size four. Note that because there is always at most one tree of each size after the recombination process, the total number of hashes we must keep track of is logarithmic in the number of leaves. So even with millions and millions of leaves, that's millions and millions of unspent transactions, uh, the total amount of data stored is still small. Besides the, uh, besides the size of the accumulator itself, what other critical factor in accumulator scheme is important? So what is the proof size required to prove a set of transactions is present? Let's say that we're trying to prove the three purple uh, leaves. So the answer is that we need the siblings of the nodes in the branches for these leaves. So in this diagram, we need the hashes uh, outlined in orange. Using these, we can recompute the hashes of everything in those purple branches. And therefore, we would have valid Merkle proofs for uh, everything that we wanted to provide a proof for. So ultimately, the proof size in U-TreeXO is at most the hash size times the number of leaves for which we need a proof times the height of the tallest tree. So how can we improve on the U-TreeXO scheme? What can be done to make the proof sizes shorter? Well, another observation about the Bitcoin blockchain is helpful here. It turns out that most Bitcoin transactions tend to be spent rather quickly. For example, the number of transaction outputs that last 10 blocks before being spent is about 10 times more than the number of transaction outputs that last 100 blocks before being spent, which is about 10 times more than the number of transaction outputs that last 1,000 blocks before being spent. So this suggests that the UTXO duration distribution follows a power law, which will be helpful later when we analyze the theoretical performance of the accumulators that we're interested in. So how can we take advantage of the fact that most transactions are spent quickly? The biggest takeaway from this talk is that it is good to keep transactions in order as much as possible, in the order in which they appear in the blockchain. So as we see here, when all of the transactions are concentrated in one part of the tree that we're proving, we have to provide less data. In fact, in this example, we only have to provide a single hash, the hash for 9568. And this is because the branches overlap so much 
to the point where we can reconstruct the data in each branch uh, just from the UTXOs at the bottom of the branches and this one additional hash. So we want an ordered tree, but importantly, an ordered tree is useless if it isn't balanced. So we want the height of the tree to be approximately logarithmic in the number of nodes, uh, so that the worst case uh, is that the proof size per value proved um, is still logarithmic in the state size, as it was for u tree xo. So this, or something like it, can be achieved using Merkleizations of well-known data structures, uh, like red, black trees, and tries, which is what we'll look at. So for example, we can attach hashes to every node of a red, black tree. And this will give us a construction that meets both of our criteria of having logarithmic depth, because the red, black trees always have logarithmic depth, depth because they're balanced and they keep the transactions in the order in which they appear. There are only two downsides with the red black tree approach. Um, one of them is that in the process of deleting a node, we sometimes require data from outside the branch that we're deleting from. And ultimately this doesn't affect the asymptotics of the scheme, but it does make it a bit less clean and it winds up being computationally expensive uh, to manage this tree data structure. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we decided to forego red black trees in our implementation. Instead, the version we ended up with uh, is a version of something that already exists in the Ethereum blockchain, which is tries. So tries are data structures where the leaves have indices and each node is associated with a certain range of indices. And the height of the tree is logarithmic now in the total number of historical transactions rather than the current number of unspent transaction outputs. Um, but that's not too much of a difference really um, in terms of the logarithm. But simplicity in this version makes it preferable to red black trees in terms of performance. So to see how we delete, uh, we see that we can just take the branches that we're going to change and we remove any nodes that correspond to ranges that don't have elements on both sides. And we can see that conveniently, this doesn't require any node data um, other than the hashes of the neighbors for the branches we changed. And then how do we add? Uh, addition is also possible. We just add new transactions on the right side. So here we are indexing transactions not by account number as they would typically be indexed in Ethereum, but by the order in which they entered the chain. So we need to make sure that the stateless nodes have the rightmost branch, which we can either send with this, uh, with the rest of the proof, or the stateless nodes can store it themselves. Um, that would just mean that the stateless nodes store log of the depth hashes, which is sort of analogous to what UtreeXO does. So in terms of mathematical results, we make two assumptions about the transactions uh, that we base our proofs on. Uh, one is that the total number of transactions per block entering the blockchain is constant. And this is based on the fact that Bitcoin has a maximum block size. So in Bitcoin, it's impossible for more than a certain number of transactions to occur in a particular block. And the other is that the duration for an individual transaction um, is independent of other transactions and is power law distributed. And that comes from the observation that uh, this is how Bitcoin transactions appear to be in real life. So more specifically, we assume that the power law distribution is a zeta distribution with parameter alpha. This just means that the number of transactions lasting t blocks is proportional to t to the power minus alpha, where alpha is a tunable parameter, and that tells us uh, how quickly transactions are spent. So under these assumptions, you can calculate how big the state size is over time. And you basically get that the state size grows like the 
block number raised to the power two to the minus two minus alpha. This means that the size grows without bound, but the growth gets slower as time goes on. Uh, but we prove that the expected proof size, uh, after ignoring the branch that the stateless nodes store, is big O of block size raised to the power alpha. And the block size is constant over blocks. So even, uh, so this is in contrast to the usual uh, state of affairs where we have a factor of the log of the state size. Uh, and it means that even as time goes on and the blockchain gets larger, the size of the proofs sent over the network to the stateless nodes is going to be constant. And an additional fact is that the proof still holds when some of the transactions are designed to make the proofs as large as possible. So if there's some kind of DOS attack happening, which is specifically designed to make proof sizes large by making uh, UTXOs and then spending them at inopportune times, then the additional proof size caused by this attack is only the number of attack transactions times the log of the depth. So in other words, there's a smooth interpolation between the constant uh, size performance in the average case uh, and then the optimal performance in the adversarial case, which is the log of the, the, log of the state size. So some stats. So to test these ideas in practice, we implemented the try approach in Go as a fork of the UtreeXO project. And we found that our approach uses about 35 gigabytes of total proof size over the course of 500,000 blocks taken from the Bitcoin blockchain. Whereas the UtreeXO approach uses about 164 gigabytes over the same period. So there is some improvement in the proof size using this try scheme. One drawback is that our code uh, does require a lot of disk, disk access. So it tends to be slower. Uh, in fact, it takes several days to compile all, the, all of the proofs in our code, uh, whereas the UtreeXO code uh, runs in about a day. So now I'll just leave you all with one final thought about the applicability of these ideas uh, more broadly, bringing them back to the topic of smart contracts. Uh, the idea for a tri accumulator comes from the Ethereum blockchain really. And in Ethereum, smart contracts on the Ethereum chain have their own storage. And the storage for those contracts is committed to by a tri. Um, however, the indices for the storage are indexed by hash uh, rather than the location of the, of the virtual data. So it would be interesting if the indices were based on the location, because then contracts that access nearby locations in the same call would be more efficient in proof size. And this makes sense because many programs access memory in a local manner anyway. This all reflects the concept of locality of reference from processor design. And it would be nice to sort of take the lessons from that field and apply them on the blockchain. So thank you all for watching my talk.